Uh, I have the pleasure of now inviting Dr. Bishwambar Prakuyalji, Chairman of Institute for Strategic and Socio-Economic Research from Nepal. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> First of all, I would like to thank uh, Rees, especially Professor Sachin for inviting me in this important event. Although I represent my think tank in Nepal, but I am temporarily residing in Seoul, South Korea, so funding must have been a problem, but I really appreciate his concern, so I am here. So I suspect that, you know, four major issues are common to uh, all the participants, you know, uh, commentators in this panel, so there will be a lot of limitations. Uh, how can Sarmiel Sek implementation plan can take us to sustainable patterns of consumption and production? Uh, actually, this plan includes the establishment of, as widely discussed already, uh, loss and damage finance facility, and then global investments of at least dollar four trillion to dollar six trillion a year uh, is recommended in this plan. Also accommodates water-related ecosystems in delivering climate adaptation benefits. So the UNFCC and Paris Agreement aims at keeping the global temperature rise well below two degrees Celsius of pre-industrial uh, levels. Uh, this issue has been elaborated already. Uh, this plan also uh, recommends scaling up financial resources, but this is a big problem and a lot of justification have been made by the experts with regards to scaling up financial resources. The agreement is implemented to reflect equity and principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. This is one of the important components of this plan. Uh, in this plan, a decision under the UNFCC emphasizes the urgent uh, need for the immediate, deep, rapid, and sustained reductions in global greenhouse gas emissions. This was what uh, been elaborated by the keynote uh, presenter a few minutes ago. Uh, with regards to uh, securing means of implementation for combating Climate change under UNFCCC, its Paris Agreement. The provision says scale of financial resources should be uh, should aim to achieve a balance between adaptation and mitigation, taking into account country-driven strategies. Uh, further elaboration may be needed during COP28. Uh, also, talks about transfer of technology capacity building, green climate fund, etc. So this is what uh, important issues under uh, the question one uh, as advice to the panel. And with regards to how can outcomes of India's G20 presidency be integrated into COP28 decisions to shed more light on sustainable lifestyles and the life economy? Well. Uh, the G20 presidency has uh, highlighted clearly the importance of sustainable lifestyle as a key element uh, in achieving climate goals. Uh, this has emphasized to encourage resource conservation, waste reduction, and adaptation of eco-friendly practices. COP28 can showcase success stories uh, of sustainable lifestyle transitions from around the world, inspiring others to follow the suit. The life economy, as you know, uh, rests on life investment, fairness, and then uh, growth investment. Uh, COP28 can foster partnership among governments, businesses, civil society organizations, and individuals to promote sustainable lifestyles and the life economy. So implementation, international collaboration, this issue 
has been very important to my mind. Collaboration is important to co-design and implement sustainable development solutions. So this will be one of the important issues, I guess, in COP28, uh, as forwarded by uh, India's presidency. India's G20 presidency has advocated for sustainable consumption and production practices. COP28 can encourage the adaptation of circular economy. Well, we understand uh, circular economy minimizes environmental impact and maximizes social value. So there is, a, there is a elimination of waste and pollution and generation of nature against the linear concept. This reminds, really reminds me about uh, the W.W. W. Rostow's growth model. Uh, you know, after a couple of years of this model when it was brought out, uh, there has been a controversy uh, with regards to two different models, a linear concept where B can never occur before A and C doesn't occur before B, um, and the cyclical uh, model. So this, uh, but what United States showed that, you know, among five different stages of growth, traditional society, preconditions to take off, which is uh, sustainable third stage of sustainable growth, and then drive to maturity, and then age of high mass consumption. United States bypassed UK by jumping over to the drive to maturity. It was the fourth uh, stage in economic development. So circular economy is more or less a compromise uh, with uh, the cyclical method. Not necessarily if the, there is an advancement in technology, if uh, there are uh, issues with regards to artificial intelligence, uh, productivity can be increased, so forth. So uh, eliminate, you know, uh, initially what we really de did was we took resources from nature, uh, transformed into product, and discarded it as a waste. But now it is completely different. Uh, so. Uh, circular economy has been an issue of discussion since yesterday uh, in this event also. COP28 can discuss about empowering communities to provide necessary tools, resources, and education. Community-led initiatives can promote local sustainable practices, foster collective action, and build resilience in the face of climate change. Uh, I presume India's successful leadership was seen in shaping global climate action and set the stage for uh, impactful COP28. This was the achievement. Uh, the consensus was on achieving net zero emissions, which we already discussed, and it is a matter of considerable controversy, but the achieving net zero emissions by mid century uh, has been proposed. Uh, promote eco-friendly practices and transfer life economy. Uh, strengthen adaptation uh, action and build resilience. Uh, when we talk about building resilience, it is a climate change on vulnerables. Uh, implementation nature-based solution. And G20 stresses ecosystem-based uh, approaches, basically. Uh, so with regards to what strategies and initiatives are available to align long-term climate finance with promotion of sustainable development, uh, new financing mechanisms could be a green bonds, which I think we discussed uh, earlier. Uh, this is a fixed income financial uh, instruments, and then carbon markets. Uh, this is a form of carbon pricing, you know, market creation with limited allowances, uh, and blended uh, finance as well. Uh, so this is uh, blended finance is basically a strategic use of development finance and philanthropic funds. Uh, repurpose fossil fuel subsidies can be advised to redirect subsidies 
currently supporting fossil fuels towards clean energy, energy efficiency, and sustainable supporting focus uh, fossil fuel software uh, uh, infrastructure projects. The need is to enhance capacity to generate domestic resources for climate action through tax reforms, improved fiscal management, and strengthening financial institutions. Management and utilization of climate finance resources is a big challenge. The other areas that includes is supporting the development of sustainable investment guidelines and indigenous peoples to participate in climate action. Uh, you know, the technology, by implementing the strategies and initiatives, the global community can align long-term climate finance. To conclude, technology transfer and capacity building is needed for environmentally friendly, socially equitable, and economically prosperous future. So a couple of e uh, issues that could come uh, under the third and fourth one uh, is limited because of the uh, time limit. Uh, so during the floor discussion, if possible, I may highlight some of them. Thank you. Thank you so much. A round of applause for us. I have now the pleasure of inviting our friend, Dr. Shri Kanta Panigrahi. He is the Director General of Indian Institute of Sustainable Development and he has worked with government and United Nations in his long career. He's a basically civil engineer who specialized in environmental planning, management and conservation. Over to you, sir. We are racing against time and we are also uh, kind of uh, standing between humanity and starvation. So, so we will, both the speakers will, uh, will bear think, with me and I don't uh, think make that, your point. Yes, that's yes. All. I don't think there is a starvation issue. But anyway, uh, <coughs> we are in the, uh, in one of the most important occasion uh, that uh, it is a global summit on life economy. Life of uh, uh, I am not, due to lack of time, I am not going into details. All of you know uh, how the uh, life mission was launched. Uh, a whole world was here. And uh, basically, Indian Prime Minister's uh, um, vision uh, was it will be a mission which will bring uh, pro-planet uh, vibes. And each of the citizen of the planet uh, will be committed at their individual level uh, to lead a uh, climate friendly lifestyle and uh, mm, uh, with minimum of their uh, carbon footprint, water footprint and ecological footprint. Their consumption pattern um, has to be uh, pro-planet mm, and the production process has to be pro-planet. Uh, the, all the waste that will be gen uh, generated has to be the responsibility of the producer. Uh, so, uh, Minister of Environment has taken many actions. You all are aware about uh, green credits mechanism and notification. I'm not going into details. It has a uh, great angle to uh, bring out. It uh, conveys great message to all of us. Extended producer responsibility, there is a gadget notification. and. Resource efficiency, um, it is not only uh, uh, at GDP level for the nation, um, but also at individual level. Um, it is not only we Indians, but also how we can inspire and uh, the entire planetary citizens to lead a, a climate friendly lifestyle uh, with minimizing their uh, adverse footprints which is uh, at the peak of, uh, at this point of time. Uh, we are certainly at the crisis. Um, uh, you all have listened uh, yesterday, uh, Serpa's uh, remark. Um, it is not only uh, India's temperature has, uh, or the global temperature is at 1.3 degrees centigrade, but it is uh, uh, it will become 2.9 very soon 
unless uh, we run business as usual and uh, the way we are running. So um, uh, I believe individual uh, lifestyle, the, uh, the kind of the personal uh, uh, level of commitment uh, not to self, own self, is very important. So um, what uh, the all of us uh, constitute the planet, uh, it is 8 billion plus uh, population, um, and uh, the aspirations are increasing. The more and more consumption uh, we are uh, to, uh, run, going toward a, towards a consumerism um, uh, or consumeristic society. And um, so uh, we have to go back to the basics that our culture, uh, which has inspired, uh, to um, austerity, uh, the Ahinsa, Satya, Astraya, Brahmacharya, Asangraha, the 11 brothers of Mahatma Gandhi, and there are all great uh, religions, uh, spiritual leaders and thought leaders uh, uh, to make this world to be more livable. Uh, we need to own the responsibility collectively. Uh, many people uh, uh, don't bother uh, to change their uh, doing the things the way they are doing now. Uh, it's very important and it, it impacts uh, heavily uh, in creating carbon emissions. And uh, so um, uh, now life uh, was a mission and uh, uh, it has uh, inspired the entire planet. There is no doubt in it. And it was the one of the drives, Indian leadership drive during G20 presidency. So um, this needs to be uh, taken ahead in the interest of uh, planetary interest, uh, which will ensure the uh, safe survival of all of us. Um, and there, I, I am not telling individually alone we can uh, do everything. There is a need of uh, every stakeholder has a role to play. The government, uh, but we cannot expect government to do everything, uh, industries to do everything, or academicians to do everything, or researchers to do everything. Everybody has to play their uh, role. We are at a crisis. Um, there is no time. Uh, time is running out. And the most important, uh, like you know, in COP27, um, we had a uh, 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 SAMI uh, SAC implementation plan, uh, which also includes a transition to sustainable lifestyle and sustainable pattern of consumption and production. Uh, it is UN SDG uh, 12, um, and uh, there are 11 targets and, um, uh, and so on. So we all are aware about it. And uh, so um, uh, um, I had been participated uh, in 14 COPs um, as a part of government delegate. And uh, I also uh, lead some of the COPs. Um, in, co in COPs architecture, um, the uh, BRICS or uh, G20, uh, these all are uh, there. Uh, parallel uh, efforts are there to making the world a better place. And uh, normally, that doesn't get a priority in the negotiation. But uh, there are side events. And uh, also in the action plan, um, uh, there is a chance of including the text and, uh, and uh, carrying out the legacy beyond. Um, the, uh, uh, the most important is, uh, it is uh, like uh, Arunabha brought out, um, only three days uh, is left uh, to end the India's G20 presidency and COP28 uh, to start. Uh, just a point. Uh, um, both uh, are happening at one point. And now, um, uh, Brazil uh, being the next presidency of COP, uh, sorry, uh, G20, um, is very much inspired. And uh, they, they are our largest supporter and partner in global biofuel alliance, uh, which was also launched during uh, COP, uh, during uh, G20. And if you see the New Delhi Declaration, I'm not going into uh, clauses. Um, uh, Brazil is very much strongly with us to carry uh, forward uh, the life, uh, um, life of uh, inspiring the global citizens. The leadership uh, may come from global south, 
but uh, global north is not excluded. Um, and uh, uh, with the leadership of external affairs ministry and uh, um, uh, RIS um, has started this journey and uh, COP28 uh, has many agenda as you are aware of loss has dam uh, damage fund. Now it is common but differentiated rep responsibility and respective capability as per the uh, Paris uh, uh, climate uh, post Paris um, uh, protocol. And uh, the IPCC um, AR6 uh, has uh, come out with a uh, report. Today it was also in the newspaper and uh, Ambassador Manjit Puri br brought it during his discourse and discussion today um, uh, that the developed nations have proportionately uh, um, uh, appropriate, uh, appropriated a disproportionately larger share of the global carbon budget. And uh, it is uh, uh, all of you are aware of. And we want a uh, we don't want a resource in, uh, intensive growth uh, what we need. Uh, uh, now uh, the methane will be discussed in COP8, um, uh, which will create a problem for developing and underdeveloped nations like India, Bangladesh, and Nepal, uh, who are sharing the dice. Um, uh, uh, the uh, North is very much uh, raising um, uh, finger to us to shut down our coal fired, uh, fired fire, fire plants. And whereas they are not uh, considering uh, resource intensive lifestyle uh, is a very uh, simple and uh, a business, as usual, business as usual matter. So um, it is not the matter of arguing or uh, debating or creating unpleasant situations. It is high time the North and South, everybody has to join hand uh, not only uh, um, and uh, to lead a um, uh, um, climate friendly lifestyle and uh, but also uh, that will that is a great link uh, with the emission reduction and uh, also uh, achieving our uh, targets uh, climate uh, um, targets india has uh, highest level of uh, um, aspirational commitments and it is uh, um, uh, in the front runner in achieving it, all of the data and strategies, statistics you are aware of. So this is uh, uh, high time. Uh, let us, all of us, come together. Um, uh, I wish uh, OECD may take a leadership to organize a side event where uh, Brazil is very positive. We have listened uh, Brazilian uh, minister uh, today morning, he is very uh, positive uh, about all the economies, impact economies, and all uh, different kind of economies where uh, life economy is uh, uh, at the top and at the peak. And this needs to be established. So um, uh, Indian presidency is over, Bra uh, Brazil presidency is coming, and South Africa uh, is also equally committed. So the three countries make an, my suggestion is uh, to go for a uh, special uh, side event uh, in the COP28, uh, bringing uh, how life economy to take further. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Shikanta. Uh, now we have the last speaker, Dr. Raman Shrikant. Over to you, sir. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, RIS for inviting me to this uh, uh, very important event. And uh, I thank Dr. Bhatt for uh, giving me the last chance to, because, uh, to speak, because I think my talk is going to be quite different from what others have spoken. So I would like to speak on the last point, which is energy transition. And uh, <coughs> I think this point is very well known. I just wanted to state it again, again and again, so people are told about it, that yes, developing countries deserve a proportionate share of the global carbon budget. Whatever has happened has happened. The whole question is what is to be done now? So this, this is a point that I think has been told many times, but basically it doesn't come out so well. So therefore we accept all these targets, though we know very well that we actually don't deserve those targets now, 
this actually the target should be first fulfilled by the developed countries rather than us. So now if you look at basically cumulative, what has happened is the cumulative CO2 emissions up till 2021, this data basically shows that India has contributed only 3.3%. In fact, if you look at South Asia, it shows that only 4% of total cumulative historical anthropogenic <laughs> emissions till date have come from South Asia, which has 24% of the world's population. That is IPCC data. So the whole question is that, okay, but we don't get together. We, I, I am very happy that RIS has brought a lot of people from, uh, you know, South Asia and I think on this platform itself. So I hope that we are able to fight this battle together. And I think we need to fight it. So this is a table that I actually have prepared. And uh, this is uh, from the Energy Institute uh, statistics, which used to be previously generated by BP. So these are the statistics from that. And what you can actually see here is that if you look at uh, uh, share of fossil fuels, now the UNFCCC, the convention, was not formed only to tackle coal. And this sort of single-minded attack on coal, I think I find it somewhat nauseating because it is about all fossil fuels. So if you look at fossil fuels, US is depending, 81, uh, depending on fossil fuels, so 81%. OECD countries overall, which include most of Europe, most of EU, Australia, Japan, 77%, China, 81%, world is 82%. So why basically we are all surprised that global temperatures are not going up? I think there is nothing to be surprised. This is the truth. This is what is actually happening. So I drank this four regions or countries in the order. So where is 15.66? Where is 9.05? Where is India with meager 2.02? So I think basically the discrepancies are stark when you actually put them in numbers. Now, what is India doing? Despite all of these things, as we feel somehow, the word that uh, basically used, Vasudeva Kutumbagam. Because we feel that in Paris Agreement, we have agreed to voluntary indices and, but of course, these indices are conditional. Now, these indices are conditional in the sense they are very much dependent explicitly on transfer of technology and finance from basically the developed countries, which is which was there right from 1992, but has not been fulfilled as everybody has discussed. So we have also submitted updated indices, even that was, so we have actually updated. So we have said, okay, that we'll now increase the emission intensity, reduce emission intensity 45%. We'll increase non-fossil fuel power generation up to 50%. So we have actually further increased. Now, we also, one very important thing, we also submitted a long-term a uh, low carbon development strategy where Dr. Butt was very instrumental in basically preparing that with inputs from Dr. Arunava with a number of think tanks in India. This has been a wonderful document which actually shows what is, what is a sort of roadmap, you know. Uh, I don't want to call it a wish list, but it says there are some things to be done. And of course, it is left to, you know, others to flesh it out. So, the, we have also said very clearly, global trans transition requires Four trillion dollars. I know there are numbers from four to six. There are lot, lots of numbers because unfortunately nobody has calculated. These are all basically numbers in the air. Now, now the whole point basically is that climate change is only climate action is only one of the seventeen SDGs. That is something that we all have to keep in mind. It is not the only SDG that is to be talking about. Of course, it is the only SDG that has a special conference by itself. Other SDGs don't matter, unfortunately. And I think this is something that I really wanted to talk about, mainly because we can't actually, I mean, I want to put it very, I don't know, I, I think as politely as possible, decarbonization cannot be at the expense of human development. If somebody thinks that basically we will decarbonize because we have global obligation, uh, more whatever obligation you call it, whatever adjective you give it, and therefore, we will cut off electricity to people. We will not supply fuel to people. I don't think that any country is going to do. And that is something that we have to keep in mind in all these dialogues of what I hear about, uh, what I think is, I think there is a lot of academic dialogue on basically, you know, sustainable standard of living. And if you see the sustainable standard of living, this is something that is published in many academic papers to my utter shock. It actually is a very promotes racism. It basically says Africa has no right to development. Their consumption is only so much, they only deserve so much. India slightly better, will give slightly more. <laughs> now who is actually somebody, who are these academic journals and basically to say 
Africa should only do this, South Asia should only do this, but Europe will continue to do what they are doing. Right? And therefore we are talking about life. This all these papers in academia, and what I feel is this, these papers get cited in IPCC again and again, and I use this uh, phrase with one of my colleagues who is going to COP28 as a government delegation. I think these IPC, IPCC authors cite each other to irrelevance. <laughs> That's what is happening. I think this is everybody is everybody knows this, and particularly at the stage of development we are all in. Human development is directly proportional to per capita electricity consumption. This is not something we can say we'll reduce our electricity consumption per capita, we'll reduce our energy per consumption capita, and therefore we will develop. It's not possible. Now, what about India? We have a young population. Our median age is only 28 years. Compare that to Europe, which has got 42. You can compare that to, you know, US 39. So, we have a young population. We have 17 percent of the world population. So, we have a right to grow and we have earned a right to grow. It's not charity. So, this is what is the projection from our central industry authority. This is the baseline scenario. And incidentally, I'd like to, this is basically showing the peak demand. It is very important to talk about peak demand because the timing of peak demand in India, all India, happens after sunset. So, what do we do then? No batteries in India. People have tried to basically, you know, get battery storage, grid scale battery storage. It's costing 10 rupees per unit at the, at the point of generation. By the time it comes to the ultimate consumer, it will be 20 rupees per unit because of all the transactions and the losses that happen. Who can afford it in India? If you look at SDG 7, it's affordable. Affordable energy is most important for Indians, for all people in developing countries. Affordability is the key. We will, we will have to go without food if we can't afford it. Or we have to drink water. And we have all done that in the past when we couldn't afford it. So the whole question is affordability. And what has actually happened is because of the post-COVID recovery, and this has happened in many countries, in India in particular, we had a target of 230 gigawatt as the peak demand for this year, 23-24. We already crossed 240. So we are now basically one year ahead of schedule as far as this growth is concerned. This is a total reversal of what used to happen in the past. In the past, projection used to be X. We were always X minus delta X. Now for the first time, we have become X plus delta X. Now this is the growth. Why is this growth happening? This growth is happening because we are young. We have, people have aspirations. People everywhere have aspirations and that's what is happening. So the bottom line what I would say is as far as electricity sector is concerned, the transition in the electricity sector requires a reliable, firm and clean alternative sources of generation. Now this is India's scenario. India's scenario basically indicates, yes, we have done tremendous work in solar power. Now our solar power capacity is 27 percent of total installed generation capacity. This includes utilities as well as industries. But what has happened? Obviously, you know, if sun, sun doesn't shine, we don't have solar energy. Same thing with wind. It only is accounting for 12 percent of the total electricity that is generated in India. 74 percent is coming in coal, from coal. And what really what has happened now is that 50 to 50 percent of electricity capacity is generating 74 percent of generation. That's mainly because all the people in academia, I think, have forgotten the word base load. What is base load? It is a minimum load that requires to be run throughout the day for running industries. Now, if you don't have industries, what's going to happen to the youth? I think we talked about in the afternoon about social. It's very important to provide jobs. If we don't provide jobs, we may have only climate change, but we'll have other things also. So I think that is something that I think our government is very conscious of that. And I think we are now making bold steps to say after six years, we have started ordering new power plants. Because for six years, we believed the promise that battery storage will come down. Now, last two years, the whole scenario has changed. And why has it changed? Because of supply demand imbalance. I think Dr. Myra pointed out, Dr. Arunabhagosh pointed out, EVs. So the Europeans and Americans are basically investing in SUV, electric SUVs. Now you have electric SUVs which are going to gobble up huge batteries, whereas if you had a hybrid, you could have actually manage with one-fifth of that. 
So the whole issue is where is basically this battery, where this battery is going? Where is the cobalt going to get mined? Congo. Where is basically the lithium available? Chile. So the whole question again we are going to have is people are talking about extractive industries. Right? The extraction is only going to happen only in the south. So now I want to come to G20. And therefore, I'm just concluding this last slide to say that what do we need? And this is a G part of the G20 declaration related to decarbonization through small modular reactors. For a long, long time, nuclear was a pariah in the world. Right? But after Fukushima, just 12 years have passed and Japan has already restarted 12 reactors. They are going to restart many more reactors now. Why? They have just realized that if they don't turn on the reactors, they are going to be dependent on fossil fuel forever. So the whole and obviously the cost of LNG has skyrocketed. So the only gainer in this whole thing is US, which has now become the largest LNG exporter in the world and therefore minting money while the uh, Ukraine war happens. So the whole question basically is, this is a technology. Why is this technology coming to the forefront now? This technology is coming to the forefront because it overcomes many of the problems of variable renewable energy. It provides basically base load. It occupies very less land, which is very important for South Asia because we have a high density of population. So it occupies very less land. It requires it's very energy dense. So therefore, it's very energy efficient. And last but not the least, it is clean. It doesn't have any carbon. So the whole problem now is that why are we not? I mean, we are chasing hydrogen, we are chasing this, we are chasing that. Right? The whole question, if I am a mining engineer, if you tell me that the copper demand is going to grow from X to Y, I will say, oh God, employment opportunities are going to be fantastic. Lithium is going to skyrocket like this. The whole question is, being a mining engineer, being in industry for more than 20 years, I don't think those targets are all practical at all. The time it takes to basically open a greenfield mine to bring it up to speed, it is going to take minimum 10 years. And basically, if you look at the IEA figures of net zero by 2050, it's all basically giving a false promise. That's all going to happen just like that. Right? It doesn't happen because we don't have people, first of all. So there, these small modular reactors are a technology based on proven technology. And this is something basically very clearly the G20 has said that this is something that should be done. Why small core? Therefore, it is very safe. Enhanced seismic uh, isolation, several passive safety features. It actually basically, SMRs have come from the ocean. We have got USS Nautilus, which will, went below the North Pole. It has it had a nuclear reactor, and there are hundreds of nuclear submarines which are operating, and people are working in confined spaces, and therefore it is proven. What is not was very important is factory built SMRs, and that is the secret to bring down the cost. And what is what I am saying is, it is not that the conventional reactors, the way that India is building or the way UK is building is dead. No, we need both. India's energy needs are so huge that we need a little bit of everything. We can't say we'll only do this. We need a little bit of everything. Advantage of nuclear this SMRs is it will help us to basically repurpose our thermal power plants. And that is a study that NIAS has done. We have identified 40 gigawatt of capacity by repurposing these TPPs with nuclear reactors, with small modular reactors. Obviously, there are a lot of issues like land acquisition and all can be minimized. The only thing what I feel is two things again, we come back to 1992, the convention, CBDR and RC, technology transfer and finance. And if this is done, we can actually be a supplier and manufacturer of SMRs to the rest of the world. If you look at the COVID vaccine, Pfizer and Moderna did not save the world. It's basically, Covishield made in India, which had the biggest impact on the developing countries. And I think we can have the same model for SMRs. Of course, we need to change our law and we need to do a lot of other things. But I think this is something that, you know, it is there in the G20 declaration. I hope basically the G20, when we have the review, I hope this is taken up seriously. Thank you. So, thank you, Dr. Shrikant. You said that India, India's energy needs are so vast that we need a bit of everything. Renewable, fossil, non-fossil, everything is needed. 
thank you for that. And uh, just very quick, two points, rather one and a half points. The, it is one of the 17 SDGs, uh, but it is not a 100-meter race or 200-meter race or 500-meter race that you can run fast and win. It is marathon and much more. Climate change is much more than just one of the SDGs are just for 2030. That's what the... And no single country can solve this global collective action problem. Having said that, I would say that we need to engage with the world as we have always done, even with those we disagree with, so that we can build a safer world. On that positive note, and the fact that India walks the talk on climate change, let us all give a round of applause to RIS DG and his team, who has done this whole workshop so meticulously. You deserve to be congratulated, all of you. And also to the whole of the audience, the distinguished delegates, you also deserve all the praise. A round of applause to all of you. The very fact that you are here until the last moment is a testimony of your involvement <laughs> and passion to this. And to the entire uh, panel, including Dr. Anunabha Ghosh, who spared his valuable time and agreed to be with us, and to Dr. Uh, Raman Shrikant, to Dr. Shrikanta Panigrahi ji, and to Dr. Famida Khatun, and to Dr. Vishwambar. Thank you. Just a few announcements. Uh, we can now disperse for the dinner, which will be held at the Silver Oak uh, in the India Habitat Center. And bus arrangements have been made. And to access the buses, you will have to go from gate number one, which is the VIP entry. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bharat. Thanks to you, sir. No, no. Aapne aake jaan bache. Nahi, main actually hone ne wala tha. Isi liye I was I was only able to put a hand. Sir, last thank to you. You thank everybody. Sir, but you are wonderful. I mean, this is of course you had. Yes, yes. I was uh, under his protective shield. So the way you got it out is marvelous, marvelous. <laughs> I was at the book launch where you had this uh, anger trouble. So, so long I have not seen you. Uh, you worked with the FBS. Yes, yes.